I almost have to look down at the page and think it's maybe a typo. Do you, do you ever stop and think, my God, it's been three decades? Yeah. Yeah, I do. But it's, uh, you know, what, three decades just go like that, really, when you're there. When you're looking at it, going stretching in front of you, it's forever, isn't it? But it's just, I mean, it's something that I've enjoyed, it's something that I've done, you know. It's, it's difficult to explain. People have used, and I don't think the Stones, as a matter of fact, I know the Stones didn't originate this, but people have used the term the world's greatest rock and roll band when talking about the Stones. True? I don't know. I mean, that's the sort of thing that critics and all those people, the terms of reference, aren't, I mean, unfortunately, they're very nice ones, but I mean, I don't know, I never think of things like that. Do you ever stop to think about the Stones and the place in history they'll occupy as far as rock and roll history, and, and more importantly, your position and your no. place? Why not? I don't like that sort of thing. I don't mind doing it to other people, but for me, it's too close. But that's interesting. If, if you're willing to put other people into a slot, can't you at least visualize what slot you think you'll fit into? No. It's too close. I keep all that away, you know? I mean, I'm a collector of things, but I don't collect anything on myself. <laughs> is, it, is it for modesty's sake, or is it... I don't it... know what it is. It's just what I'm like, you know? Does it, does it embarrass you when you hear other people talk about the fact that you're legendary? Yeah. It does? Yeah, I mean, it's for, obviously it's very flattering. It's like saying the greatest rock or whatever you're called is better than being the worst, isn't it? You know, I mean, I appreciate the difference in words there. It's nice to be called the greatest than the worst, but uh, yeah, I do get embarrassed. But I, I'm like that, you know? I've, I've heard you say, and I've read interviews with you where you say, you know, I'm just lucky I played with a successful band. You know, otherwise I'd be like a million kids out there. D do you think that's true of drummers in general? Yeah, no. No, not in general. I think so, my type of drummer, a band drummer, you know, I've always seen myself as a member of a band. You know, and I, when I play with bands, I very much play in the band. I'm not, I'm not a sort of a Steve Gadd or a, or a Buddy Rich or something, you know, I mean, they are, you know, they're in a book as drummers and you book them for, you know, that, that's how great they are. I'm not like that. I'm very much a band member. But if you talk to Keith Richards or Mick Jagger, they say the opposite. They say, thank God for Charlie well, Watts for 30 years. Well, they're very kind, aren't they? <laughs> kind and generous, I suppose. The modesty is, is something that people have talked about for a long time with you, and it is heartfelt. Everyone has said, this is not forced modesty. And you're sitting on your hands there, and I can tell that this sort of I'm thing... I'm sitting on my hands, because my wife will say, don't keep touching your face when you're on television. <laughs> so I do this in interviews to keep... And I get... Uh, most dramas have habits. I mean, very bad ones, some of them. But they do things like this, and I often do that. All right, and I'll keep my eye on your hands. silly things with your feet you do, which is a, a nerve. I mean, the, the very nature of playing drums is a nervous twitch, really. You know, all this sort of thing. It's a, it's a cross between being an athlete and a, a totally nervous wreck, really. Did you like the music when you started playing with the Stones? I didn't know anything about... Uh, Keith Richards taught me rock and roll, and... Uh, Brian and Keith taught me, I used to love Jimmy Reed, and we used to sit all day. See, I was working as well in a studio, design, you know, painting and that. And uh, I suddenly became unemployed, I think the word is. And uh, uh, we'd have, so I'd have the days free, and I was living with uh, Mick's hat. Mick was uh, the signee of this apartment, so, but we all lived there because it was cheap, you see, i.e. nothing. <laughs> so uh, we'd have nothing to do all day, but we'd just play these records over and over again. So I, and I learnt to love Muddy Waters and people like that through uh, an intensive three-year crash course, you might say. I mean, Keith turned me on to how good Elvis Presley, well, they used to hate him up until then. Bearing in mind I was about 21 then, 22. Elvis was like the least uh, sort of person I'd ever want, you know, I mean, Miles Davis was more what I would, that's what I considered someone, not Elvis, you know. 
Fats Domino was someone I considered, you know. So, but he turned me on to lots of other people like that. Did you think this was a group that had the chance to survive? No. <laughs> No, no, every band I'd ever been in lasted a week. You know, I mean, you only lasted as long as the guy in the club or whatever would book you for, you know, so if they didn't like you, you know, it was two gigs and that was it. So I always thought it was going to last a week, then a fortnight, then, and it suddenly, that's what went, to get back to the beginning, it's suddenly 30 years, and it's only when you say, now, 30 years, and you look back and you think, but, yeah, but it's not that long really, is it, really? When the Stones came to the U.S., 1964, I guess it was, do you remember the kind of reception you got? Our first tour of America was uh, not the success. I mean, you know, you'd be in... I remember going to some place, I don't know where it was, but it was in, like, one of these cow palaces or something, and there was, like, 200 people in this huge arena all around the bandstand, and we drove in in a motorcade. That was thanks to the Beatles. I mean, they expected us to be like that. But it warmed up quickly. And yeah, we were very lucky. We had a couple of big records. And pretty soon, the response to you was similar to that of the Beatles. The women were screaming. The kids were girls. swooning. The girls were screaming. Do yeah, I mean, I've always had my... I'm not... I'm not, I never have been a great fan of the Beatles' music, you know. I do like a lot of it, but I mean, I don't mean, but we just know them, and I do, I, I love Ringo Starr, he's a lovely man, and uh, I used to like, I don't know the other two, but I used to know John a little bit, uh, so, but when people say, oh, it's like, the Beatles, the phenomena of them was something else, particularly in this country, but I don't think... Maybe it's, again, it's this thing you say, oh, I can never see myself in it. Uh, I don't think you could put the same sort of madness that they had going in this country, particularly. I think there was at concerts when you'd turn up and play, but I, I mean, generally, you know, where you had every joke on television was a Beatle joke mm. or something, or the Brady Bunch would say, I'm going to a Beatles. You know, on that level, dolls with them in. I mean, unbelievable, really. In many ways, though, the response the Beatles got and the image of the Beatles allowed the Stones to be what they became. It allowed us, but we, we in turn, had to fight that off. Not I, This isn't a hang-up, by the way. It's just a, a sort of looking back at these things. Yeah. We had to tell people, no, we're not from Liverpool. We play this, we do this. Brian was very good at that. In fact, it was a crusade of Brian's life to be this spokesman used to have a list of things written out, what he was and what, what he wasn't, wasn't, you see. But that, that comes from being put in this young English group. People, you know, in those days we called a group, uh, you know, I mean, it's a name that you was banded around for you. W were there times that you just said, I need to get home? I just yeah. need to be home? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I hate to... I, um, when I say that, I love going on stage, I love the lights, and I love playing. But I hate packing a suitcase. It takes me weeks to pack a suitcase. I mean weeks. Uh, and I hate um, going away from home. I hate, I still do. Even coming here, I hate leaving the front door. It's, it's, it's incredibly incongruous with the life you chose. Yeah, I know. I, I don't know if I chose it, it's foisted on you. I can't be a drummer and sit at home and play. If you're George Gershwin, you can, you know, you write, you can sit, one imagines this, of course, or Cole Porter, you can sit there and play the piano and send it off to the publisher. If you're a drummer, you can't do that. <coughs> Hence, you have people like Art Blake, who spent 70 years on the road, you know. But you just gave me the opening, because oh, you've spent this whole interview saying to me, I don't know if I'm that good at what I do. I just do this. But you know what, Charlie, if you weren't that good, no one would want you to go on the road. They wouldn't care that you well, sat home with your family. OK. Uh, well, then, when I say I'm in a band, they actually are employing the band, not me, if I say. But that's my get-out, you know, I suppose. If you yeah. want to nail me down, which you <laughs> seem really pleased on doing. No, I, I don't seem pleased on doing it. It's just that, you know, I, so many times today you find people who want to take credit 
for what they do. And it's a little disarming to find someone who's had so much success who seems to want to take no credit. All right, then, let's say it's easier to say, you know, if it's given to you, you can sit back and say, but I'm not particularly that pushy a person at any rate, you know? I'm not. I don't like over-the-top things anyway. Something dramatic, I hope I'm not being too dramatic by using that word, is, has happened. Bill Wyman has said, that's it. That's pretty dramatic. Yeah. It's taken us a bloody long while to find a bass player, but carry on. Well, but that is, in most people's opinion, the key partnership in a rock and roll band, drums and bass. Mm. This is a guy you've played with for an awfully long time. How difficult is it going to be to pick up and move on? Uh, oh, pick up, move on? No, that's not hard. Whether it's going to be as good as with Bill, I don't know. I'll have to wait and see. It, I think well, I, uh, 10 years ago, it would have been devastating. Now, I'm not quite so. What's Personally, for me, it's devastating because I like Bill Wyman a lot. I used to go and sit in his room, and he's a very amusing man. I mean, whether he's being serious, to me, when Bill's being serious, he's totally very amusing. So I, he's, and I'm used to him, and I, you know, I mean, it's part of being, being on the road. It's, I'd go and knock on Bill's door, whatever's going on. We'd laugh or something. So for me, it's going to be a big, it, it's, it is. And now, I mean, I'm working now. I've been working two months in Ireland. We've got a, another month in Ireland to do next month. And uh, I miss him already, you know. On the road, I will miss him as well. You decided you wanted to try the jumps. You took a banjo. And you ripped the neck off. Mm. And bought some brushes. I never ripped it. I took it off. Gently. Yes. Was that your first experience playing? No, on the newspaper. I used to play with a newspaper and wire brushes. Because that's what Chico Hamilton used to be famous for, was the brushes. Well, the records I had. And uh, then we ha I had a banjo, and I had the book to learn to play it, and all the dots. I mean, have you ever seen the, the guitar chords and all that? Oh, it drove me mad. So I didn't like that, so I, w I was doing the newspaper and brushes, so I took the head, uh, the head off the, the banjo and used to use that. Do you remember your first real drum set? Yeah. Do you buy them or someone buy them no, for you? my father bought them for me. I forgot who played in England. They're called pubs. Yeah, they call them that here, like bars, you know. Do you remember the day they came? Well, it came uh, two weeks before Christmas, but I wasn't supposed to know that. And it was in my auntie's bedroom, hidden under a blanket. But I went up there and saw it. Were and you it was called a Broadway drum kit. How many piece? Th uh, just the two snare drum and bass drum. Were you a, a terror when sin. you got that? Yeah, I think anyone that has a son or daughter now, there's a lot of girls that play very good. The drums must be, deserve medals. Or at least half their income for the first eight years, because it's hell. I mean, you, a bass drum going on the floor is unbelievable noise especially in the hands of someone that can't play it. I mean, I'm not very good at it now, but then must have been hell. How, how did you teach yourself this style? I used to have a dance set, a uh, record player. That's, you know, the, you know, where they drop down eight right. things. There, well, actually there. And you put a record on, and I'd be going along with it. Did you enjoy that? Here I did, yeah. Not here, in the ears, but in the mind, yes. I was playing with Charlie Parker, you know. For those who are not of the age where they were acutely aware of his music, but have certainly heard the stories, can you describe what it was about Charlie Parker that captured you? No. Well, yeah, the same thing that captured me about Muddy Waters, just the sound of it. And I've never had any problem listening to it. You know, a lot of people say, oh, God, it's just a noise, or... It's difficult to understand. I've never felt like I never, I've never had trouble listening to, you know, Cecil Taylor or, or sort of Arnett Cobb. And, you know, I mean, they're just all the same. 
how do you copy? Because I've heard you say, and I've read where you say you copied the drummers. Yeah, it's, see, it's I, didn't, I didn't go to school and learn how to play a paradiddle. I watched Art Taylor play a paradiddle, <laughs> and I did it like him. There were guys in England that I'd go and see as well. Phil Seaman was one. Any desire back then, Charlie, to say, wait a second now, it's very important that I learn to read music and go for the, the formal training? No, I was more important in the, in the life and looking like it, really. But then I was 15 or so, you know, 16. But I should have done the, the music, but it would have been much easier. When I get with people like on this record I've done, when you get with people like Brian Lemon or Peter King, you know, they sort of say, oh, it's like this, and this ream of music come out. Well, it's easier for me to say, well, play it through and I'll catch up with you, than read that, you know. But to them, it's just... It saves a lot of worry as well, you know, when you're going on to do a set. If you've got it written down, you don't have to worry about what you're going to do next. I have to remember it all. It drives me mad. Charlie, let's not talk about the Charlie Watts Quintet. Is, is this a case of Charlie Watts coming full circle? Maybe, eh? I don't know. <laughs> it's just something I've always wanted to do. Uh, it's, uh, the people in the quintet I've, I've liked, apart from Gerard, he's not old enough, uh, for many years. I mean, Peter King is one of the, I mean, he is world-class player. And Brian Lemon, I've seen on a bandstand, and the bass player David Green, I was living. It, we were teenage, you know, not younger than that. We were brought up together. He used to play teach us, and I'd play the brushes. We used to swap jazz records together, and I've known David since he. he I, I did my first professional gigs with David. Except he was so good, you know. He went on. He used to. I mean, he played at a club in London called Ronnie Scott's. And uh, when Ronnie would have people like Ben Webster and all that, David would back. And there's a lovely guy in a, American called Scott Hamilton, and David plays with him a lot. There's a lot of great American players that David plays with. So despite the nervousness of having it all come together, it's, it's got to be a very comfortable situation. Yeah, well, it is. They're very comfortable to play with, except some of Peter's clever arrangements. But... Uh, it's, no, yeah. I mean, I've known David for, I mean, his mother rings my mother up to ask what we're doing, you know what I mean? It's one of those. <laughs> this is family, just about. Yeah, well, it is family, and uh, we're 50. But it's still the same, you know, I have to okay things through Mrs. Green as well as my mother, you know? I mean, that's how close we are, really. Charlie, 30 years plus, during that time, musically, when have you been the happiest? One of the m most thrilling moments was doing this record, when I'd assembled this whole orchestra at great expense of the quintet, and Brian Lemon went like that, he's the piano player, like that, and the orchestra, and we played a song called My Ship, and Bernard Fowler sang My Ship, in one take, and that's the one on the record. And I thought, that was, I've never, very rarely do experience those sort of things, for me. The music comes from the Charlie Watts Quintet, it's called Warm and Tender. You know why I like this most? The girl on the cover. Well, not only that, yeah, your daughter's no. beautiful, but it also is the reason you came in to talk to us, and I know you no. don't do this often. No, thank you. Charlie Watts, it was a pleasure. It was. Continued success. Thank you. That's it for us tonight on Later. See you tomorrow night and again. Thanks for staying up.